Well, if you have a Bible, Matthew 28 is where we're going this morning. We are in week number two of a series called, You've Got Questions, God's Got Answers. And I love some of the questions we've been getting. How do I do devotions with my kids? What's the deal with all the Bible version? Is remarriage after divorce a sin? Can a Christian have tattoos? Can I lose my salvation? As a matter of fact, that's the question that we're going to be answering next week. Can I lose my salvation? It's going to be awesome. Uh, All of these questions have been coming in, and they've all been great, but they've caused me to think church can be a really confusing place. It doesn't matter what church. It can be this church, any church. Church can be a very confusing place. If you don't know the rules in a particular church, in a particular denomination, it can be very confusing. Very much. I, I learned this when I was really young. I, my mom, she took us to Catholic Church. Many of you know I grew up in the Catholic Church. And, and I went, but no one ever really told me the rules. And you know, in Catholic Church, there's some rules. I'm not, not dogging on them this morning. But they, they had rules, and nobody told me the rules before I went. I usually had to break them before somebody would tell me what I was doing was wrong. So I understood from watching. Like, you can figure out the we kneeled, we stood. We kneeled, we stood. We kneeled, we stood. And then we sat, and then we kneeled, and then we stood, and then we kneeled, and and, and it was great. But I remember getting in so much trouble one particular Palm Sunday. And and I didn't know, I I didn't know, I wasn't trying to be irreverent, but I didn't understand that if the priest blesses something, you're considered, you are to consider whatever the priest blesses as something reverent. So you're, you're to hold on to it. So he blessed these palms, and he gives us these palms leaves, and we're walking out of the church with the palms, and I, true story, I didn't know that you were supposed to be reverent with the, with the palm. And, and so I was sword fighting everybody with the palm. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And, and if you get that, that's great. It's the greatest movie ever. But I, I remember it. My mom was like, quit, 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 quit. I was like, why? And she said, it's been blessed. I'm like, really? She said, yeah. And so I quit. And then I had to tie my shoe. Well, if something has been blessed by the priest, not only do you not sword fight with it, but you do not put it on the ground. So I took the palm, and I put it on the ground, and I bent down to tie my shoe, and these ladies came by, and they were like, (gasps) and I was like, what? You put the palm on the ground. I was like, where am I supposed to put it, lady? Am I supposed to put it on the ground? And and I remember, honestly, if somebody would have just told me the rules, I would have tried very hard not to offend anybody, but I didn't know. I remember the first time I visited a Presbyterian church. I didn't know how they baptized people. I, I accepted Jesus in a denominational church. That, that was my early um, Christian background. And in and, and the church that I attended, they dunk everything. It was like being in the Baptist church. It wasn't Baptist, but it, was, but it was similar to that. So I remember going to the Presbyterian church, and we're moving things for this youth event that was going to happen. The youth pastor that I was helping from my church and the youth pastor from the church um, for the Presbyterian Church in town, we were putting on this big youth rally in town. And we were clearing out the pews from the sanctuary, and we got to the baptistry, and I went over to it, and, and, and the guy shouted, you can't move that! And I was like, why? I, I had been a Christian for like three months. I was like, why? And he said, that is the baptistry. And, and I just asked because I didn't know, I wasn't trying to be irreverent, I wasn't trying to offend him, I wasn't even trying to be funny. I just said, you must all have some small people up in this church if that's where you baptize. I, I, I didn't know. Church is confusing for your kids, too. I remember one time we went on vacation in Branson, and we went to a Pentecostal church. We, we didn't know that we were going to one. It was just the biggest church in the area. And so we decided, hey, we're on vacation. Let's, let's go to church there. But some things happened. The guy started talking about how you needed to have enough faith to buy your own airplane. And, and at that point, we just got up and left. Another sermon for another time. But we went to the kids' building to get our kids and we pulled our kids out, and this guy followed us out, and he said, hey, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. He said, let me tell you something about your son, and he said it really angry, and, and, and so he said, about your son, and, and so fumes started immediately coming out my ears. I said, what did he do now? He said, well, we were worshiping, and the Spirit of God came upon me, and I started, I started praising God and speaking in tongues, and your son shouted out, are you speaking Spanish? And I grabbed Jaira, and I took out, and the smile went across my face. But it's confusing, right? It's confusing for you if you don't understand what's going on. It's confusing for young Christians, old Christians. It's confusing for kids. I remember as a kid and growing up, even in my young Christian life, being so confused. There's so many 
confusing things that take place in the church. And we just kind of take it for granted, those of us that have been coming for a long time. But we don't understand these things. A friend of mine, um, I had been saved for about three weeks, asked me to come watch him get baptized one night. I went and I watched it, and I didn't understand it. I was a Christian, but I knew nothing about it. People keep te- kept telling me that I needed to do it, but no one could tell me why. Did I have to? W- what was this whole baptism about? What did it even what does it even mean? What does it have to do with eternity? So I started searching out what it meant. And I would say that in churches nature, all over the country, that baptism is a very, 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 very confusing deal. So one of the things that we've established here at Central Church is, is we, say, we say this. Let's strip away everything that's not in Scripture. And, and let's have a church that honors Scripture more than it honors tradition, more than it honors the opinions of men and women. And let's just have a church that completely honors Jesus. Let's do a church as close to the church in the New Testament as we can. Now, now some people will say, well, the New Testament church didn't have all these lights and stuff. Well, they didn't have heat either. And they didn't have air conditioning. And they didn't have indoor bathrooms. But we all enjoy those. So one of the things that happened in church that's very confusing is this thing called baptism. This question that we're, we're going to look at this morning is, What's the big deal about baptism? I want to talk to you about baptism this morning just for a few minutes because baptism really, really, really is an important deal. It was never intended by God to be something that we stick on at the end of service. Hey, we need a filler in here. Do we got anybody to baptize? Yeah, let's bring them up and let's dunk them. It it wasn't intended to be like that, but many churches have made it that. Jesus meant for baptism to be a really big deal. Listen, if you know the story of Jesus, then you know Jesus was crucified on the cross and he tore apart what separated man from God. Well, the cool part of the story is, after they killed him, he came back to life. You can't kill Jesus. He keeps just showing back up. So he came back to life, and before he went back to heaven, he said these words in Matthew chapter 28. If you have your Bibles, Matthew 28, is where we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning. Matthew 28, the Bible says this. Jesus came and told his disciples, look at this, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. This is Jesus talking. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. Jesus did not say, form a holy huddle and see how deep you can get. Just love each other and tell everybody else to go to hell. He he, he did not say that. Jesus said, go and make disciples. And then he says this, of all the nations, not just people like you, he says. He says, go and reach everybody, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all of the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said that as we go, as we're going, because we're not supposed to stay, we're not supposed to just remain in our seats as we go and we begin to make disciples of all the nations. See, see, you've seen it here at Central. People who have asked Jesus to come into their, into their life, that's making disciples. They enter into a relationship with Jesus. He said, as you're doing that as the first step, they should, or as you're doing that, the first step they, they should take after receiving Jesus is what? Is baptism. He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have you ever read something in Scripture and went, why did God say that? Like, what's the big deal? Is baptism really that big of a deal? I I want you to know something this morning. Yes, it is a big deal. Now, I want to say there are several people in this room. You come from different religious backgrounds. You have different beliefs about baptism. Some of you here this morning are very confused about baptism. I want you to hear me once again. Baptism was never meant to be confusing. Baptism was never meant to be one of those things that we have to sit around and wonder about. All I'm going to do today is teach you what Scripture has to say about baptism. Scripture says four things um, about it that I'm going to get into this morning. The first thing that the Bible says about baptism is that baptism is going public. Baptism is going public. See, see, when you love something or you love someone, you don't have a problem going public with someone or something that you love. In the um, late 90s, early 2000s, there was this music group that came out. Y'all remember them? I, I remember I went to a youth rally one time, and this little girl was like, ah, 
of the Backstreet Boys. And, and she had gone to a Backstreet Boy concert, and, and one of the guys had touched her hand. I kid you not. She put a plastic bag on her hand, and she didn't wash it for like weeks. And I'm like, girl, you've got rank hand. You need to take a thing off, and, and you need to wash that. She had everything Backstreet Boys. She had Backstreet Boys hairbrush. She loved them. She was in high school. She got mad at me because I told her, I said, girl, if you love Jesus like you love the Backstreet Boys, you would change this world. But the deal is, she didn't have a problem going public with someone or something that she loved. If you love something or someone, you don't have a problem going public. I, I was at a basketball game Monday night. It was a close game. But when the Carroll Tigers started to pull away in the end, when they scored, no Carroll fan went, shh, there are people here that pull for the other team. We don't want them to feel bad. You need to golf clap. No, we're going crazy, throwing babies out on the court. It was great. We don't have a problem going public. If, if there's a woman here, ladies, when a guy asks you to marry him and he put that rock on your finger, you didn't go, well, all the other women might feel inferior if I show them the rock, and so I better just sit on it or keep it in my pocket. No, you were like, ha, 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 look at that, honey. Don't you wish you had this right here? Uh-huh, I'm better looking than you are. I'm getting married. You're not getting married. You went public. You don't have a problem going public with someone or something that you love. Jesus said that's what baptism is. Baptism is when you and I go public with the fact that we are completely, totally, radically sold out to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, let me kind of set this up for you. Let me give you a little history lesson on baptism. Like, like I said, it's not difficult un to understand when you take the Bible and you combine it with history. It's a really easy concept to understand. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo. Literally, that means to dip under or immerse. Right before the time of Jesus, like maybe 50 years before the time of Jesus, it, it, it really had no spiritual significance whatsoever, the word baptizo. Think about that. There was a time in history where baptizo was an everyday, ordinary word. You would ba use baptizo to describe what would happen when merchants took cloth and they dyed their cloth. They baptizoed it in the dye. They dipped it under it, and it became the color of whatever they baptizoed. Baptizo was a word to describe what happened when a ship was sunk in battle. They were baptizo. Baptizo meant, you know, when you take your Oreo, your Oreo cookie, your double stuffed Oreo cookie, and you baptizo it into milk. I, I made that one up. But do you understand what I'm saying? Baptizo was a common, everyday, ordinary word. Now in this time, you had two groups of people, in which you still have these two groups of people, but, but two groups of people that existed. You had the Jews and you had the Gentile. If you weren't a Jew, then you were a Gentile. Probably most of us in this room are Gentiles, which just means that you were not born Jewish. Now here's the deal, and this is great. The majority of the Gentiles in that society, in that time period, were polytheistic. Polytheism means that they worship many gods and goddesses. You, you've heard about the Greek god and goddesses. You had the god of war, you had the god of river, you had the goddess of sex, you had the goddess of this, and the goddess of that, and the god of this. They, they were religious because they worshipped many gods. And you could just go out and you could just make up your own god. Hey, we need a god for, for this. Okay, let's, let's use this god right here. We'll make up. Got a, got a new god. We're making many gods. They're polytheistic. But let's say you were a Gentile, and you lived in this time period, and you began to notice people over here called the Jews. Now, the Jews were unique in the fact that they claimed that there were not many gods, but there was one God, and he was the true God. He was the living God. He was the only God worth worshiping and serving. So you sat there, and you were checking out these Jews, and they worshiped this one God. You started saying, huh, I like that. I believe what they believe. I, I, I don't believe all these gods really. I, I believe there's one God, and I believe what they're teaching. Man, I'm connecting with that. And so you went to the temple, and it, you're a dude, and you went to the temple, and you talked to the priest, and you said, hey, man, I'm a Gentile, but I would love to become a Jew. I believe the way you guys believe. I, I mean, what you guys have got going on, that, that's great. I want that. What do I need to do? Now, if you're a man, this is where your commitment level really gets questioned. If you're a woman, not that big of a deal. But if you're a man, the priest would say, well, there's this surgical procedure that we need to take you through. It's called circumcision. Now, at that point, I'm sure most men were like, you know what? Zeus isn't that bad. 
you went home, honey, we're pagans. Enjoy it for the rest of our lives. Seriously, so, some of you might be thinking right now, what is circumcision? If you don't know what circumcision is, you can call our church office this week after 5 o'clock and talk to Darren. He would love to explain it to you. I'm not doing that this morning, but Darren would love to. Anyway, it, it's an operation for men. <laughs> and and anyway, the, the first step you had to take, which that means if, you're, if you were becoming a Jew, is you had to say, I'm committed. I'm bought in. The second thing you had to do is you had to offer a sacrifice to the temple. The third thing you had to do is you had to agree to be submissive to the law of Moses. The first, fourth thing you had to do is you had to receive a special meal. And the fifth thing you had to do, and this, again, was around the time of Jesus, the Jews ad ad adapted the ceremony, were a Gentile in front of everybody. It was a public ceremony, and the Gentile would walk into a pool of water and dip himself or herself under the water completely immerse themselves and then come out what this was 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 very symbolic of the fact that washing away the way that you used to live as a gentile and when you came out of the water it was symbolic that you were a brand new person right about the time that jesus came onto the scene this word baptizo began to take on some spiritual meaning some spiritual significance now was there was this guy that appeared on the scene right before Jesus, and his name was John. We know him as John the Baptist. And, and this is where a lot of people get mad and say, well, we got Baptist in Scripture, it's, it's John the Baptist. Why don't we have Mark the Methodist and Peter the Presbyterian, Ernie the Episcopalian, and all that. I've, I've met some Baptists that say, we're right because we're in the Bible. That's stupid, because that's not what the Baptist means. So if you're Baptist and you say, we're in the Bible and we're right, <laughs> you're wrong. The Baptist is not a reference to a denomination. The Baptist is a reference to the nickname that John received because of what he did. John began to go out by the riverbed and teach people. Now, now let, me, let me say this. Let me, let me set this up. The riverbed was a public place. Like anybody who was anybody hung out at the riverbed. Hey, man, what are you doing tonight? Yeah, you know what, dog? I'm going down to the riverbed. That, that's, that's the way that it was. Everybody in that time period went down to the riverbed because this is where the philosophers, the teachers, the rabbis, and everybody gathered. So they all went down to the riverbed, and John comes down, and he starts teaching this radical message. And the message was this. It's not good enough to be born of you. If you're a child of God, live like you're a child of God. Identify with God. Follow his ways. John would scream, and he would yell at these people. He would call them vipers. I, I love John. He was great. He would scream, he would yell, he'd spit, he said, you're wrong, you need to repent of your ways. And there were people at the riverbed would go, you know what, he's right. I'm not living the way that I'm, I, I, need, I need to be living. And, and, and after John would get done teaching, these people who identified with his message would come down to the riverbank and they would meet John at the water. John did something during this time period that had never been done before. He would take them and he would baptizo them under the water and pull them back up. And when he did that, everybody at the riverbed looking would go, oh, because most of them knew that these Jews were wanting to make a life change. And everybody understood what that meant. They would say, well, that guy just got baptized, but he's a Jew. That guy just got dunked. That woman just got dunked. But, but they're, they're Jews. What, what he or she is saying is, I identify with John. I, un I identify with what John's saying. I identify with his teaching. This is me publicly declaring that I'm changing my ways, that I am a brand new person. It was an incredible service, and they would have these huge baptism services. And because John was the first person in history to start baptizoing people, he literally got the nickname John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, John the Washer, Washing Man John. That's what they called him. That was his nickname. So when Jesus, the, the Bible says this in Luke 3, 2 through 3, Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. John said, you know what? You need to go public with the fact that you're not going to live that way anymore. That's why when Jesus came along in Matthew 28, 19, he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Jesus is saying, I want my followers to go public for me. 
Somewhere Christians have gotten into this mindset that this world is all about me and my personal comfort zone, and we don't understand that it's God's zone. But we go, this is, this is my space. This is my zone. This is my bubble. And because this is my space, this is my bubble, my zone, my faith is a personal, private issue. It's okay to be a closet Christian. It's okay to kind of keep it silent. It's okay to kind of keep it hidden. But church, we, we've talked about this before. Jesus Christ went public for you and for me when he died on the cross. He was beaten. He hung naked. He died. Where in the world do we ever get the idea that he wanted us to keep that silent? If we truly believe that Jesus is the only way to God, where in the world do we ever get the idea, shh, you're not supposed to talk about that. We're supposed to talk about Jesus. We're supposed to be vocal and pu- in public in our faith. And the very first way that we go public is baptism. The second thing I want to teach you about baptism this morning is that baptism is being obedient. Baptism is being obedient. Life is better when people obey, is it not? Like nobody in this room has ever been pulled over by a a cop because you were going the speed limit. You know why I pulled you over? No, because you were going the speed limit. (laughs) Yeah, I got to quit that, man. Sorry. Life is better when you're obedient. Life brings more peace when you're obedient. Don't you love it when other people are obedient? For, for example, this, this is a confession. This is my shortcoming. Many of you know this. Many of you are like this. Many times, I will get into the 10-item or less lane, and some of you do this as well, and I begin to count the items that people have. It, isn't it nice when, when you count items for other people or when other people are counting for you? You know, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, you're, you're cool. What's up, man? Pa- pack of gum? Now, now, now you got six. It's great. But when you got nine, ten, you're like, oh, he's crossing. And, and, and you start getting, oh, he's got so many items. He's got so many things. Seven, eight, nine, ten, 14, 17. Eight. Can you read the sign? How hard is it to obey, right? If you're a parent, you understand how wonderful it is when your children obey. But, but this is the thing. This is the thing that I've observed, parents. This is the thing that melts you down more than anything else in the world. It melts me down. It melts you down. This right here is a parent will cause you to have just like bad thoughts. The thing you need to remember when this happens as a parent is don't get your hands around their neck. But it's when your kid tells you this. When you say to your kid, go in there and clean your room. When you get done, do this, 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 and this. And your kid looks at you and says, why? I've seen parents. I saw a mom one time. Her head split open and the beast of revelation came out. I was like, oh, that's the Antichrist right there. Because you're like, listen, as a parent, the most common answer to that question is what? Because I said so, right? You, you, you all understand it. Obey me, kid. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out of it, make another one that looks just like you. Right? As a parent, you're looking at the kid going, because I'm smarter than you. Just obey me, because if you obey me, it makes life so much easier. All the parents are like, get this CD, get this DVD afterwards. Let's download this MP3. I know my kid's only two months old, but we're going to put this in his room. Look at this, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Baptism is not an issue of personal preference. Baptism is an issue of obedience. See, here's the deal. Becoming a Christian is a lot more than just getting out of hell. Don't me stop and say this. I'm really excited I'm not going to hell. Hell, hell's like one of those, hey, you want to go to hell? Not really. Well, you need Jesus. Well, sign me up for Jesus then. Give me some Jesus. No hell. Don't want to go to hell. Hell's one of those places that I do not want to go to. And so when people talked about hell, I would get freaked out. So do many other people. That's the major reason why many people do accept Jesus. But one of the things that we've got to understand is being a Christian is a lot more than just not going to hell. Becoming a Christian is not just about Jesus getting you out of hell and into heaven. Becoming a Christian is about getting Jesus out of heaven and into our life and allowing him to take complete control. That means whatever he says to do, you do it. Whatever he says to stop doing, you stop doing it. We become completely obedient servants of Jesus. And and the first thing he asks us to do in obedience is to publicly identify with him through baptism. That's one of the first things he asks us to do, to go public and say, I'm a follower of Jesus. 
I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I belong to Jesus. Now, every once in a while, somebody will ask me this question. Ryan, do I have to? Do I have to be baptized? Now, I'm going to answer that question one of two ways. I'm going to answer it the politically correct way first. Are you ready? The politically correct answer is no. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. Baptism does not save you. You do not have to be baptized to get to heaven. There, there are people here that would argue with me. I, I won't even have that argument. I made a decision a long time ago to not argue with Christians about stupid things. I think you've got to get baptized to go to heaven. Great. Go dunk yourself. Go grab a whole bunch of people and throw them in swimming pools. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to tell this guy about a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? L- l- listen, when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified between two thieves. One thief mocked him. The other thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, today, tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. They didn't have to come at that point, get the thief off the cross, dunk him, and stick him back up here. So is baptism a requirement to go to heaven? No. Here's the biblical answer. You get the politically correct answer, now I'm going to give you the biblical answer. What? Are you kidding me? What? You mean to tell me that you're willing, if you're asking this morning, do I have to get baptized? You're saying, Ryan, I'm willing to accept Jesus' death on the cross for me. I'm willing to accept the fact that he died a horrible death and received the wrath of God so that I don't have to receive the wrath of God. And then I'm accepting the fact that, that he agrees to walk with me every single day. I'm willing to accept the fact that eternity would literally be hell without him. And my question back to you is, if you're willing to take all of that, then why, when he asks you to do this one thing, to go public for him, why won't you do it? Guys, that just doesn't compute. If that's your attitude, then my question to you is, have you met him? Have you? Have you entered into a saving relationship with Jesus? Because once you meet him, the next step is to go public. L- let me say this. I almost skipped this. Let me say this. In Acts chapter 2, the early church had this. P- Peter in Acts chapter 2 preached this incredible message. And then in verse 37, the Bible says this. When the people heard this, referring to Peter's message, when the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's skip down to verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people baptized out of obedience. Peter said, do it. Go public. Oh, yeah, go, go public. That makes sense. That's what I'm going to do. Go public. That's what you need to do. Go public. The third thing baptism is, is baptism happens after salvation. Baptism happens after salvation. Now, once again, as I told you earlier, I grew up in the Catholic Church. Again, I I didn't know anything about baptism. I started following Jesus. I went to a denominational church where two things were taught. Number one, that you needed to be immediately baptized because it equals salvation. And, And number two, that you were being baptized into the church. Now, I thought both of those things were goofy. I had met Jesus. I was changed. I was completely different. No one was going to tell me I had to do anything. And so I started searching it out. I got baptized a few months later after I had determined what baptism really meant. That baptism was an outward expression of my inward decision. And that I was going public for Jesus. That it didn't make me a Christian. Just like a wedding ring does not make me married. But it was showing the world that I am. That I'm not ashamed to identify with Jesus Christ. I was at a church one time, and a guy came up to me. I was working at a church, and he said, I've been baptized three times. He, he had never made a decision to follow Jesus before. And that day, he gave his life to Jesus, and he said, do I, do I need to get baptized? I've already done it three times. I said, did you know Jesus when you did it the first time? He said, no, I was a kid. I said, did you, did you know Jesus the second time? He said, no, I was, I was probably like 20 years old. Do you know Jesus this time? He said, yeah, this time I've prayed. I've given my life to Jesus. I said, before you were just a wet sinner. He got baptized. Baptism equals after salvation. 
let me hit three things here, and this will get highly controversial and highly tense, and it will make a lot of people ask a lot of questions, and I love that. Because my job as a pastor, I think, isn't to answer all of your questions. It's to challenge you with Scripture and, and make you think for yourself. A lot of people say, I don't like that. I want all of the answers. When you die and you get to heaven, you'll get them all. Nobody else down here has it figured out, including me. But three groups of people, and the first group I want to address is the people in this church who your story is kind of like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Your story is that you prayed to receive Christ, and then you were baptized. And after you were baptized, maybe you got with the wrong group of people, or you went to college, or you sought a career, and this career path or whatever, you, you strayed a long way away from God. You started down a path that you really didn't intend to go down, but you went there. And now you've been coming back to church, and, and, and you feel like you need to be rebaptized in order to rededicate your life. First of all, let, let me say this. The term rededicate is mentioned nowhere in the Bible. Just fall in love with Jesus like Jesus wants us to fall in love with him. And, and for a lot of people, that, that, that's your story. You, you don't have to be rebaptized because you were baptized after you received Jesus into your life. You made some bad decisions, and so you've came back to Jesus, and you're coming back to, to Christ is literally as easy as telling Jesus, I'm coming home. Jesus, God, coming home. It's that easy. Can't be that easy. It is. It really is that easy. Jesus, I'm coming home. You don't have to be rebaptized. Now, for the second group of people, this gets a little more tense. There's a group of people that maybe you were seven, eight, nine, ten years old. You were in a church, and your friends were getting baptized. And your mom and dad, who loved you, and they meant well, said something to you like, Hey, do you want to get baptized? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe. I, I don't know. Well, you get a Bible if you get baptized. Oh, a Bible? Yeah, I want to get baptized. Because bapti baptism and Bible, somewhere in Scripture says that. You, you, they go together. But you ran up front, and you got baptized, and you had no idea what it meant zero. They dunked you, or they sprinkled you, or whatever, and you were like, don't know what this is all about, but everybody's happy. Made mama cry. It's all good. Then, since that day, you've received Jesus. You made a decision to follow Jesus. You might have made that decision last week. I, I don't know. And your question is, well, do I have to get baptized now? Because I was baptized when I was seven, or eight, or ten, or fourteen, but now I have just Receive Jesus. This time, I meant business, and I've asked Jesus to come into my life. Do I need to get baptized now? Yes. Because when you were seven or eight, all you were was a wet sinner. Baptism happens after salvation. The third group of people, and, and there's really some confusion with this, is the group of people that were baptized as babies. Now, there's a lot of people out there that were baptized as a baby. In fact, what I want you to do right now, even though we're on video, is that if you were baptized as a baby, would you just raise your hand? Everybody look around. People in this room baptized as babies. Now, l let me tell you two things about your baptism as an infant, okay? Now, now calm down. I, I know that some of you got your foot on your brake. I, I want you to take your foot off of the brake, okay? The first thing about your baptism as an infant is you don't remember it. That, that's true, isn't it? I've never had anybody come up to me going, when I was two months old, they took me to the church and they stuck a little white dress on me, brought me up there, the pastor sprinkled water in my face, it ticked me off, but he sprinkled water in my face, he said some words, and then we all went to Pizza Ranch. Nobody has ever said that to me. The first thing about your baptism as an infant is you don't remember it. The second thing about your baptism as an infant that I know is that it was an incredibly religious and significant event in the life of your parents. Your parents celebrated that day. Your parents rejoiced. And whatever you believe about infant baptism or whatever, and, and I'm going to get into that in just a second, your parents were happy that you were baptized as a child. So here's the question. People come to me and say, Ryan, I was baptized as a baby, and now I have received Jesus into my life. Do I need to be rebaptized? The answer is, and, and this is kind of weird, the answer is yes, but not rebaptized, you need to be baptized biblically because baptism always happens after salvation. Two quick things, and if you don't believe me, ask the questions, call the office, search the scriptures. Number one, there's not one instance of infant baptism anywhere in the scripture. Now, now stop. 
you're not going to hell. Your parents are not going to hell. You're not an evil, evil person. Don't go burn down the church you were baptized in. I'm not saying that. This is not anti-anything, all right? So just calm down. I'm just saying that there's not infants being baptized in the Bible. It comes from church tradition and not Scripture, okay? The second thing I would tell you about infant baptism is this. Every baptism in the Bible was after somebody met Jesus. There are 27 references to baptism in the New Testament. And every baptism in the New Testament happens after somebody has received Jesus. You say, Ryan, do you, do you do infant baptism here at Central Church? No, but we do baby dedication. We don't baptize babies because we don't want the parents and the children to have a false sense of security. I've, I've met people that tell me that they're going to heaven, and the reason they think they're going to heaven is because they were baptized as a baby. Baptism as a baby doesn't get you in because it was your parents' choice, not yours. Let, let me explain this. Jaira, when he was born, let, let, me, let me back up a little. I'm a huge IU basketball fan. And so when Jaira was born, we put this on him for his pictures. This is Jaira's one-day or two-day-old picture right here. And, and, and listen, when someone saw him or when you look at that picture, none of you are going to sit there and say, that child chose Indiana. You're going to know that if I stuck an Indiana shirt on my son or my daughter, that I chose to dress them that way. I've told you this before about NFL teams, that I'm a huge Colts fan. And for the longest time, my son Jaira was not a Colts fan. It didn't matter how many times I told him that the Colts are the true way, boy, that you have to be a Colts fan, that if you look at your veins, there's blue running through your veins. Like, that's, that's the way that we live and that's the way that we breathe and that's the way that we die is that we are Colts fans in this house and so for the longest time my son was a Steelers fan and then after that he became a Panthers fan and just recently I rejoice because he has seen the light and he has become a Colts fan but but here's the thing it didn't matter how many times I told Jairi you need to be a Colts fan he had to come to that decision himself on who or what team he was going to follow it's the same thing with infant baptism. Parents, you, you can't choose Jesus for your child. You could pray for your kid. You could bring your kid up in a godly home. But baptism is for somebody that when they receive Jesus, then they're baptized. That's what it is. Fourth, the last one, baptism is a powerful symbol. Baptism is a powerful symbol. A few years ago, went to Washington, D.C. with my family. And I remember us getting to do some really cool things. We, we, we went to some really cool places, saw really cool memorials. I, I remember going to the World War II Memorial. It was pretty powerful. The Lincoln Memorial, it was awesome. The Washington Monument, it was great. But you know the most powerful time in that visit at Washington, D.C. was for me? You know what rocked me to the core? Is when we went to the Vietnam War Memorial. I got to that war memorial and there were two types of people there. There were the people that were kind of running around and playing and laughing. You could, you could see families. They had ice cream. It was a really hot day. We had ice cream and, and water. There, there was that group of people. And then there was the group of men and women that you could tell had been there. In some way, it had directly impacted their lives. Either they were there or they lost somebody in that war. They stood in front of that wall with all of the names of the soldiers on it. And they wept. They found the names of their friends, their family members. And I remember sitting there and thinking that day, just standing here, I could tell who's been there and who's just heard about it. Baptism is the same thing. Whenever I see a baptism, I can tell who's been there and I can tell who's just heard about it. See, when somebody stands in a baptism pool and they stand there and we ask them, who is your Savior and Lord? And, and they publicly say, Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. They say that publicly. And when they go under the water and they come back up, it's symbolic of two things. And if you're a Christian, you've got this down. You, you, you know it's symbolic, number one, of the fact that every time you see somebody baptized, every one of you that's a Christian, you should say in your mind, that was me. I was lost and now I'm found. I was dead and now I'm alive. I used to live that way, but I'm not living that way anymore. I used to deny Jesus and now I've gone public. The second thing is, it's a reminder of the fact, you know what? Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And because he died on the cross and he rose from the dead, I can be alive too. Baptism is not something that we mourn. 
It's something that we celebrate because people are saying, I am a brand new person in Jesus Christ. So here's my question to you. Have you been captivated? Have you come to Jesus? Have you come into a relationship with Jesus, but you haven't followed him into baptism yet? Has Jesus captivated your heart? Being a Christian is not just about not going to hell. It's about living the captivated life for Jesus. Have you allowed Jesus to captivate your heart? This is how I want to close this thing down. Here, here's, the, here's the reality this morning. There's some people in this room, and you know who you are. You're a Christian. You've prayed. You've, you've, you've received Jesus. You've made that commitment, but you've never been baptized. You've never gone public. You've fought it. You've denied it. Some of you have been here at Central, and you've rescheduled it. Well, I'm here to tell you that March 29th is your day. We're baptizing March 29th, week before Easter. And, and that is your day to stand in the pool and say, Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. If, if you're here and you, need, you know that you need to be baptized, you know you need to go public, you've not been baptized since you've received Jesus, I'm not going to ask you to go, I, I'm not going to ask you to stand up right now, I'm not going to ask you to do it. I'm going to ask you to go out in the foyer. Somebody's going to be standing at the table out there and they're going to guide you into signing up. They're going to get some information for you. We're going to talk about this for the next three or four weeks. But March 29th is your day. You say, I've got plans already that day. Cancel them. Nothing is more important in your walk with Jesus right now than being baptized. Listen, we've baptized quite a few people here at Central, and not one person has ever said, I'm sorry I did that. It's a rejoicing time. It's your time. It's your next time. Pray with me. Jesus, you said in your word that if we would just lift you up, that you would draw all men to yourself. So Jesus, the reason we do church is because of you. You're the reason we do everything that we do. Thank you for those that you have spoken to this morning, for those that you're drawing even now into their next step of baptism. Jesus, we celebrate what you're doing in this church. God, this is only the beginning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all that you are doing. God bless you all. Have a great week.